This is Space Time Series 27, Episode 38, for broadcast on the 27th of March, 2024. Coming up on Space Time, scientists are for the first time capturing the end of the planetary formation process. Stand by, the Devil's Comet is on its way. And could fine dust particles have killed the dinosaurs? All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers are for the first time witnessing the final stages of planetary formation and the clearing of the protoplanetary disk in a newly formed star system. Scientists believe planetary systems like our own solar system contain more rocky objects than gassy rich ones. Around our Sun, for example, these include the inner planets Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars, as well as the main asteroid belt and the Kuiper belt objects such as Pluto. On the other hand, the gas giants Jupiter and Saturn, the ice giants Uranus and Neptune, contain mostly gas. But scientists have known for a long time now that planet-forming disks usually start out with 100 times more mass in gas than solids. And that leads to a pressing question. When and how does most of the gas leave the nascent planetary system? Using the James Webb Space Telescope, astronomers obtained images of a nascent planetary system or circumstellar disk, the two terms are interchangeable, which was actually in the process of actively dispersing its gas into the surrounding space. The study's lead author, Nahum Baha, from the University of Arizona, says knowing when the gas disperses is important because it gives scientists a better understanding of just how much time gaseous planets have to consume the gas from their surroundings. During the very early stages of planetary system formation, planets coalesce in the spinning disk of gas and dust around the young star. Gas close to the young star will condense into solid grains of dust. These particles eventually clump together, building bigger and bigger chunks called planetesimals. And over time, these planetesimals collide and accrete together, eventually forming planets. The type, size and location of these terrestrial planets depends on the amount of material available and how long it remains in the disk. So in short, the outcome of planetary formation depends on the evolution and dispersal of the disk. The new observations reported in the Astronomical Journal are centred around a young star system called Ticha, which is enveloped in an eroding circumstellar disk, notable for its vast dust gap spanning approximately 30 astronomical units. An astronomical unit is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, about 150 million kilometres, or 8.3 light minutes. 30 astronomical units is about the distance that the planet Neptune, the most distant planet in our solar system, orbits around the Sun. Baha and colleagues were for the first time able to image the disk wind, as the gas is referred to when it slowly leaves the planet-forming disk. The authors took advantage of Webb's sensitivity to light emitted by an atom when high-energy radiation, for example UV radiation in starlight, strips one or more electrons from its nucleus. Now this is a process known as ionization, and the light emitted in this process can be used as a sort of chemical fingerprint. In the case of the T-char system, tracing two noble gases, neon and argon. The observations also marked the first time a double ionization of argon had been detected in the planet-forming disk. The neon signature tells astronomers that the disk wind is originating in an extended area away from the disk itself. Now, these winds could be driven either by high-energy photons, essentially the light streaming from the star, or the stellar wind, or by the magnetic field that weaves through the planet-forming disk. In an effort to differentiate between these features, the authors performed simulations of the dispersal driven by stellar photons, the intense light streaming from a young star. They then compared these simulations to the actual observations, and they found dispersal by high-energy stellar photons could explain the observations really well. The authors concluded that the amount of gas dispersing from the T-char disk every year is equivalent to that of the Earth's moon. While neon signatures have been detected in many other astronomical objects, they weren't known to originate from low-mass planet-forming disks until the first discovery in 2007, which was made by NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope. 
The authors also discovered that the inner disk of Teacher is evolving on very short timescales of just decades. They found that the spectrum observed by Webb differs from the earlier spectrum detected by Spitzer. Now, this mismatch could be explained by a small asymmetrical disk inside of T-char that has lost some of its mass in the 17 years that's elapsed between the two observations. Along with other studies, this new research also hints that the disk of T-char is at the end of its evolution, and the team might be able to witness the final dispersal of the dust mass in T-char's inner disk within the next few decades. We'll keep our fingers crossed. This is space time. Still to come, the Devil's Comet on its way and could find dust particles have killed off the dinosaurs, at least the non-avian ones. All that and more still to come on Space Time. A Mount Everest-sized comet's making its first visit to the inner solar system in more than 70 years, and it could be visible to the naked eye over the next few weeks. The object, known as 12P Pons Brooks, is due to reach perihelion, its closest orbital position to the Sun, on April the 21st, which is when it will be at its brightest. It'll pass to within 0.78 astronomical units of the Sun. And as we mentioned earlier, an astronomical unit is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, which is about 150 million kilometres or 8.3 light minutes. This comet's furthest orbital position from the Sun, Aphelion, sees it located some 17.2 astronomical units away, which is almost as far as the orbit of Uranus. However, the comet's orbit is almost perpendicular to the ecliptic of our solar system. The ecliptic's the plane around the Sun where most of the planets orbit. 12P Pons Brooks is currently in the constellation of Pisces, and it's roughly 242,292,258 kilometres from the Earth. The comet's thought to be the probable parent body which brings rise to the annual Draconid's meteor shower. It will be closest to the Earth on April the 21st, that's the same day it reaches perihelion, at which time it'll be some 117 million kilometres away. Comet 12P Pons Brooks completes its orbit around the Sun every 71.3 years, and so if you miss it next month, it won't be visible again until 2095. The icy body, which is thought to have a nucleus about 34 kilometres wide, was first recognised as a comet back in 1812. However, there are records of it being seen as far back as the 14th century. It's named after the French astronomer Jean-Louis Pons, who discovered it in the early 19th century, and British-American astronomer William Robert Brooks, who observed it on its next orbit in 1883. There's been plenty of interest in Pons Brooks over the past few months, driven in part by a couple of unusual features. Firstly, photos of its approach have captured the comet's curious green colour. Now, that green is caused by a molecule called dicarbon. Dicarbon absorbs sunlight and re-radiates some of that light in the characteristic green tinge. The other attribute that's piqued the interest of observers worldwide is its occasional horned appearance, giving Pons Brooks the nickname of Devil's Comet. Now, the reason for the pointy horn shapes appear to be because the icy object is classified as a cryovolcanic comet, meaning that it regularly erupts with lots of dust, gas and ice when pressure builds up inside it as it's heated by the sun. As these eruptive gases flow off the comet, they give it the impression of having a couple of horns. The Deputy Executive Director of the Royal Astronomical Society, Robert Macy, says people shouldn't expect to see some dazzling bright object, the kind of image you see in photographs. Comet Ponsbrooks was discovered or recognised as a comet going round the sun every 71 years back in 1812 by a French astronomer. However, it was seen as far back as 1385, so right back in the 14th century by the Chinese. Now, it's what's described as a Halley Comet, and what that means is that it takes a few decades to go around the sun. It's not one that takes tens of thousands of years, and equally isn't one that just whizzes around every few years. Now, this comet is about 34 kilometers across. That's the nucleus, the heart of the comet, and that makes it more or less the size of Mount Everest. Ponsbrooks is at its best for the Northern Hemisphere from March through to mid-April this year, and it'll be not the easiest thing to spot. It's basically in the west-northwest after sunset, and that changes as the weeks passed. 
but don't expect it to be dazzlingly bright, the kind of image you see in photographs. It's not going to be like that. This is something that might just be visible to the naked eye. If you don't have a moon in the sky, if there's no light pollution, and if the weather's really clear, then you might stand a chance. But for most of us, we're going to need to pick up a pair of binoculars, uh, ideally look at one of the apps you can get on your phone showing you where things are in the sky, or a finder chart of some kind, and that'll really help you to track it down. And when you see it, it's likely to look like a sort of small grayish fuzz, quite typical for many comments, but you will have the satisfaction of knowing you've seen this once-in-a-lifetime object. That's Robert Massey, the Executive Director of the Royal Astronomical Society. And this is Space Time. Still to come, could fine dust particles have killed off the dinosaurs, at least the non-avian ones? And later in the science report, scientists have developed a new lithium sulfur battery capable of being charged in less than five minutes. All that and more still to come on Space Time. A new study claims that fine dust particles thrown up by the Chicxulub asteroid impact led to the mass extinction event which wiped out 75% of all life on Earth, including all the non-avian dinosaurs. The KT boundary event asteroid impact occurred some 66 million years ago when a 10 to 15 kilometer wide asteroid slammed into Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. The collision triggered a global impact winter, leading to the mass extinction event. Now, a new study reported in the journal Nature Geoscience modeled the effects of the impact generated silicate dust and sulfur, as well as the soot from wildfires. The authors found that fine dust could have remained in the atmosphere for up to 15 years and would have contributed to cooling the Earth's surface by as much as 15 degrees Celsius. They suggest that this dust could have blocked photosynthesis for over 600 days after the impact, leading to massive extinctions of animal and plant species that were not adapted to survive dark, cold, and food-deprived conditions. The KT, or Cretaceous Tertiary Boundary Event, released more energy than 100 teratons of TNT. That's more than a billion times as much energy as the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki to end World War II. The initial impact created the 180-kilometer-wide Chicxulub crater, throwing molten ejector and debris high into the atmosphere, triggering a massive tsunami hundreds of meters high, together with devastating earthquakes, land tsunamis, and volcanic eruptions which shook the entire planet. Shockwaves from the collision circled the Earth, while burning debris from the ejector began raining back down onto the surface, causing an intense pulse of infrared radiation which cooked any life exposed to it, and combining with the molten lava flowing from volcanic eruptions, sparked global wildfires which devastated vast areas, burning up vegetation and killing any animal life on the planet's surface that survived the initial blast wave. Importantly, the asteroid impacted the planet at a location rich in sulfate-containing gypsum. That was instantly vaporized and dispersed as an aerosol into the atmosphere, only to rain back down later as highly caustic acid rain, burning everything it touched and causing long-term effects on the climate and food chain. The smoke and ash from the wildfires and volcanic eruptions, together with dust from the ejected debris, initially created a blanket-like greenhouse effect, preventing heat from escaping and causing surface temperatures to soar. Eventually, temperatures did begin to cool down, as the smoke, ash, dust and ejected debris blocked out sunlight for months, if not years on end. That created an impact winter, which caused temperatures to plummet. At around the same time, massive volcanic eruptions in what is now India, known as the Deccan Traps flood basalts, began flowing across the subcontinent. That pumped out even more toxic gas and pollution into the atmosphere, further contributing to the growing impact winter. Evidence for this global catastrophe can be found right around the planet in the form of a dark line boundary in the geologic record. Known as the KT event boundary, it contains high levels of the metal iridium, which is rare on Earth, but highly abundant in asteroids. This is Space Time. Time 
now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. Gene editing has been used for the first time to successfully eliminate all traces of HIV from infected immune cells in a laboratory. The hope is that it could one day be used to target HIV DNA, which acts as a reservoir for the virus in people living with AIDS. The gene editing system uses a small piece of genetic material called guide RNA to direct enzymes called CRISPR-Cas to the HIV DNA hiding in the cells. These enzymes then act like molecular scissors, allowing scientists to very precisely cut the DNA. The European Congress of Clinical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases has been told that one of the big challenges in HIV treatment is the virus's ability to integrate its DNA into the host's DNA, making it extremely difficult to eliminate. The authors say they've now developed an efficient attack on HIV in various cells and the locations where it can be hidden in reservoirs. They say these findings represent a pivotal achievement towards designing a cure strategy, although they do stress that much more work is still needed. The human immunodeficiency virus HIV is an infection that attacks the body's immune system, causing acquired immunodeficiency syndrome or AIDS. It's thought to have originated from infected primates in Western Central Africa and was first identified in humans in May 1981 when a large cohort of otherwise healthy young biological males suddenly began dying from a range of unusually rare diseases. HIV targets the body's white blood cells, such as helper T cells, especially CD4 plus T cells, as well as macrophages and dendritic cells. It weakens them, causing the progressive failure of the immune system. And this allows a wide range of opportunistic diseases such as tuberculosis and several types of cancers to become critical, eventually killing the patient. HIV spread from person to person through the body fluids of an infected person, including blood, breast milk, semen and vaginal fluids. The only known treatment involves powerful drug cocktails known as antiretroviral therapy or ART. The World Health Organization now estimates up to 52 million people have been killed by the AIDS virus, with another 40 million people currently living with HIV. A bit of good news for Australia's grey-headed flying foxes, with their numbers now remaining stable, despite the species having recently been listed as vulnerable. A report in the journal PLOS One analysed data from Australia's National Fire and Flocks Monitoring Program, finding that between 2012 and 2022, the grey-headed flying fox population remained stable, with their range also stable. The authors say this is good news, as it may mean these bats have the ability to travel long distances and eat a broad range of foods, which help them develop resistance to various disturbances, such as fire, drought and heat waves. They say the vulnerable listing was based on counts taken during the 2019-2020 megafires, which were heavily smoke and access affected, and they recommend the listing advice now be reviewed. New research shows that the next generation of lithium sulfur batteries may be capable of being charged in less than five minutes instead of several hours for the current lithium-ion batteries. The findings reported in the journal Nature Nanotechnology examine the sulfur reduction reaction, which is the pivotal process governing the charge-discharge rate of lithium sulfur batteries. Scientists investigated various carbon-based transition metal electrocatalysts, including iron, cobalt, nickel, copper and zinc, finding reaction rates increased with higher polysulfide concentrations, as polysulfide serves as the reactive intermediates. In the end, the scientists designed a nanocomposite electrocatalyst comprising a carbon material and cobalt zinc clusters. High-powered lithium sulfur batteries can be used in devices such as mobile phones, laptops and, importantly, electrical vehicles. The problem is current state-of-the-art lithium sulfur batteries suffer from low charge discharge rates and typically from 1 to 10 hours for a single full charge discharge cycle. NVIDIA has released its new H100 chip, which is said to have up to 20 petaflops of power and is 7 to 30 times faster, with just a quarter of the power consumption of other chips. With the details, we're joined by technology editor Alex Sahara Royd from Tech Advice Start Life. NVIDIA is now a $2 trillion company because it has created the H100 chips, the Grace 
Hopper chips, named after the lady who came up with the term bug and was working on the mechanical computers all those uh, decades ago. And uh, of course, her name sounds like Grasshopper, so it's quite unusual she came up with the term bug because there was a little cricket inside one of the mechanisms that was giving out wrong information. So her name has been immortalized as the uh, the Grace Hopper chip, which is the chip, the H100 chip that is powering the generative AI revolution. Now, NVIDIA is the creator of graphical processing units, GPUs, which normally people use for games. But these GPUs have been wonderful for AI. So at their conference, they launched a new platform called Blackwell. Now, this is named after a mathematician, David Harold Blackwell. And uh, these new chips offer a significant performance boost, up to 20 petaflops of power, between 7 and 30 times faster, but up to 25% less power consumption. The chip comes in multiple configurations. One is in the configuration that all of the H100 chips are in all these data centers around the world. You can just pull this rack out, plug in the new rack. Everything else is the same except you get this massive performance boost. So this new chip's called a B200, but there's a G B200, the Grace Blackwell, which takes two of these chips, puts them together, and the chip then acts as one giant processor. And uh, NVIDIA was uh, really pumped about these new processors. And in fact, this technology is also powering new robots. There were eight robots on stage. All these other robots are able to now reason. And um, it's sort of the C-3PO style of robotics coming through. And we're going to see these well before the end of the decade, doing things in people's homes and acting as personal companions in a way that we've only dreamt about with sci-fi. So already there's a robot called Figure One. It's powered by open AI and it is able to uh, handle things with great dexterity and uh, reason and give you feedback on how it did its job. And this was one of the robots that was on stage. So NVIDIA is bringing forth humanoid robots of the sort that we've seen in sci-fi, but you know something that uh, will really be helping you in homes soon. I mean, it might still be years away, but well before I reckon the end of the decade. And these new processors are going to, they're not going to come out till the end of the year and no doubt AMD and Qualcomm and Intel everyone else is going to be really energized by this and going to want to uh, come up with their own processes in response but we're seeing this exponential increase in AI computing reasoning power that is something that's really exciting to see and we're lucky enough to all be living when this is happening no longer is it something from an Isaac Asimov novel but we're seeing it unfold every day in front of us the idea of a humanoid robot with that sort of computing power does make me glad my name's not Sarah Connor. <laughs> well, and, and look, the most important thing to realize is that for all this computing power, this is still extremely primitive compared to where we'll be by 2030, for example. Oh, I mean, yeah. it's, not e- it's not even, you know, three months, four months into 2024. What we're going to have by the end of the year will just blow us all away. Yes, we do have to worry that uh, some sort of dystopia is not going to be created, that uh, we won't have Skynet and robots wanting to make sure that they're never switched off and we're turned into Duracell batteries like in the Matrix, all those worries are very real, but it is still exciting to see this happening, you know, this level of technology. We've been sort of stuck for 30 or 40 years. It's gotten incrementally better, incrementally better. But ever since the generative AI revolution, we're seeing a real massive increase in computing power beyond the incrementalism we saw from Intel in the in the 2010s and even the incrementalism we see in the smartphone process. I mean, they get more and more advanced, but that massive jump that's like generational in one year as opposed to the generational jump over 10 years. This is coming and it's, it's exciting. That's Alex Sahara of Royd from Tech Advice. Start life. And that's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from Spacetime with StuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. 
And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 